You know, I really do sound like a nerd, I know. That, but that's that's I the love point. The yeah. that's, that, that, is, that is absolutely why we're here. Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Lopresto, and today I am here with Stacey Abrams, former minority leader of the Georgia House of Representatives, gubernatorial candidate, and founder of Fair Fight 2020, the campaign against voter suppression. But also, Leader Abrams just happens to be a dyed-in-the-wool nerd and a hardcore trekker, which is why I'm honored to be here to nerd out with you for a little bit. So thank you so much for Happy coming. Happy to be here. Live long and prosper. Image of Sirac, father of all we now hold true. Do you remember like when you first, did you catch it like originally on syndication? Did you know about Star Trek from like the 60s show and the movies? Or was it just like, what is this magic space show and how can I get more of it? My older sister had a TV mm -hmm. and she came and got me and she was like, come watch this, this weird show with me. And I sat in her bed and I saw the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation and I was hooked. What sort of appealed to you so much about Star Trek? Like, what is the, the, the fundamental pull that just makes you so intrigued by it? I love the concept of space travel, but also time travel. And what I loved about Star Trek The Next Generation, but what was, I think, perfected in Star Trek Voyager and now in Discovery, is their real interesting interplay between space and time. I, I think what has been so interesting to me about The Next Generation, about Voyager, yeah. about the later iterations is that you can address those core fundamental economic and socio-economic issues but conflict remains mm -hmm. and the challenge is how willing are we to find solutions when we think we have the answers and so what i think differentiates the later treks from the original is that yes it still acknowledges the utopia that is earth but it also notes that we still have a lot of work to do that humanity in its multiple iterations finds reasons to disagree and our responsibility is to find a way to integrate that diversity and still tackle those challenges. I, I was reading uh, about your book, Lead from the Outside, and I know that you had written extensively about a certain episode of TNG called Peak Performance. It's just a perfect little small episode where everyone gets something to do. Uh, would you like to sort of explain to the audience sort of the premise of it? Okay, so Peak Performance is at a moment where Kul Rami, is, who's this expert, is brought on board to assess the Enterprise and its readiness, given that it is the mothership for the Federation. And so they have war games. And while the war games are playing out where Picard is on one ship and his first in command, uh, number one, is on the second ship, they divide up the crew. But while that's playing out, they also have this game called Stratagema, where Data is challenged to play Kolrami, who is this master strategist. Well, Data, who is uh, an android, loses, which seems impossible because this is a strategy game and he should be smart enough to win. The computer beaten by flesh and blood? He then goes into this deep depression, has this sort of psychic break, decides that he has to take himself offline, and Picard, being the captain that he is, challenges him to realize that he, even he can be fallible, and his responsibility is to understand how to be successful. And so he comes back and he defeats uh, Kolrami in another game of Stratagema, not by trying to defeat Kolrami, but by realizing if you avoid taking the obvious risks and the obvious challenges, you can find your way to victory anyway. And that is how I've completely organized my political career. Speaking of, uh, when, when you say when Picard does challenge Data, uh, he says a very famous quote. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. I know that. <laughs> and, and yes, exactly. Like, especially in light of what happened well, with I, your gubernatorial campaign. I, I made some mistakes, but that's not why we didn't win. Clearly. But I mean, that is life. And all you can do is you can't beat yourself up over it. You can't let it fundamentally change your nature. Exactly. You just have to kind of roll with it, figure something out, try to change it for the better and, and win next time. And figure out what victory actually looks like. Mm. Uh, I've been castigated by the other side for saying we won. Mm. And part of it I take from peak performance. If victory in an election is only about a politician getting something, mm -hmm. then we're in, a, we're in a world of trouble. Mm -hmm. But for me, I recast victory, and I think about victory always. Am I advancing the conversation? Are new people able to be heard? Mm -hmm. And when that becomes my metric, then in the spirit of peak performance, we won because we tripled turnout among communities of color. We increased the number of Democrats for the first time with the highest record turnout in Georgia history. Mm -hmm. And I got pretty close. 
And those are victories for people who want to see that change is possible. Mm -hmm. And that's how we get to the utopian world of Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's a bit presumptuous. No, no, no. I love it. Just what, what an amazing. Like, if, if, if you're a Riker fan, this whole episode is just Picard saying he's the finest officer I've ever known. <laughs> it, it's just like he is so daring and innovative and jovial. He's the best. Wesley isn't annoying. He's actually thoughtful. He comes up with a solution. He cheats. Wesley suffers often from being too perfect. Mm -hmm. In this episode, Wesley is creative and thoughtful. And as Doherty pointed out, they didn't tell him he could. That's true. And he wasn't lying. It was his science experiment. It was experiment. a science experiment. He just yeah. happens to be really smart. Are you normally not a Wesley fan? I'm not. So I don't despise Wesley the way some do. I know this may finish me as an acting ensign, but shut up, Wesley. Wesley is like the annoying little brother. Yes. And he did that very well. And he's certainly not as bad as like Anakin Skywalker in episode one. I, I'm not a Star Wars person, so I'm not gonna, okay. I, I don't wanna get a new, a new group of haters. But Picard versus Janeway, they're both very different leaders for very different situations. I mean, the wonderful thing about Voyager is that the captain is not perfect. She is a deeply flawed human being, which makes her so strong. When you contrast her with Picard, who I also love, I love Janeway, I love Picard. Picard is the epitome of who a captain should be. But that's why I'm also interested in seeing his new show to see what they do with it. I hope they don't eviscerate the character they spent so much time building, but I do hope they continue to show the dimensions to who he is. Janeway is a, a little more not by the book. She's a little more passionate, a little more um, c committed, I guess, emotionally. I want to know why you didn't tell me about this. Because I remember how stubborn and self-righteous I used to be. I figured you might try to do something stupid. But that's because she has to ferry, you know, her small crew of what, 140 people, uh, 75 years across the Delta Quadrant. Picard's got over a thousand people uh, on his enterprise. You know, he is much more, uh, I don't want to say clinical. He's archetypal. Uh, yes. He's archetypal, but his challenges are often internal. Mm. It's how he grapples with communicating those morals that he holds to be true mm. while he's still trying to reassess and reassert where the Federation fits. What I love about Janeway is Janeway is unmoored from the place that situates her, but she still has to carry the ideals with her. Mm -hmm. Picard is responsible for deploying those ideals across the galaxy. His responsibility is to remain the, the static version of what the Federation is when confronting all of these dynamic changes. Mm -hmm. And I think this, that just makes you a different type of leader. You're I really do sound like a nerd, I know, that, but that's, that's I the love point. the show. Yeah. That's, that, that, is, that is absolutely why we're here. I'm going to give you uh, even more uh, some, some nerd fodder here. Okay. So then you read it AMA. Uh, you were kind of asked to rank, not rank, but uh, where certain tracks stood on your, uh, yes. on your hierarchy. And Deep Space Nine was towards the bottom. And a lot of writers were like, I'm so sorry to hear that. I love Silly. And you said it's because there wasn't enough Trek there. Uh, do you care to elaborate? Have you, okay. have, you, have you thought a little bit more about it? Here's my, my hierarchy. Voyager's number one because it combines a dynamic captain, actual space-time continuum you know, displaysion, and it's just a robust story that gets told over a pretty, you know, seven seasons. Mm -hmm. Next it is Star Trek Next Generation, Card is still perfect, and the story is the way they relaunch the series. Third is now Discovery, because I love what they've done with Michael Burnham, how they're reorienting the conversation, mm. and how effectively in the second season they address those time challenges that you have. Fourth is Deep Space Nine, but here's my issue. I love Avery Brooks. I watched him in Spencer for Hire, I watched him as Captain Sisko. I think he's fantastic. But that was much more of a military political narrative than it was a science fiction Piece. They use science fiction to expand some of the stories, but the core of the narrative was really about the tension between the Cardassians and the Federation mm -hmm. and the Bajoran. I think it's fascinating, but it wasn't for me the most compelling. I do a lot of that in my day job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for me, the, yeah. the escape of the other treks was stronger. I put the original Star Trek next. Um, you know, it just, it is. And then Enterprise. Yeah. Love Scott Bakula, we'll watch Quantum Leap every day, yes. but Captain Archer was not given the best deployment. 
sort of the discourse around the franchise is that it's inching more towards more mainstream blockbuster kind of action. It's basically been Abrams, comma, JJified, for lack of a better term. <laughs> I love both because there are some people like yourself who are going to come for the movies. Hopefully we can get you to stay for the series. Mm -hmm. But for those of us who are embedded in the series, we get to watch the evolution of change. We get to watch the evolution of thought. And we get to see people be failures. If CBS came to you and said, Ms. Abrams, we would like to give you the book. You have the con for the next Star Trek show. What was your dream Star Trek pitch? I think we've done enough recovery of past history. And I think it was necessary to bring people into the franchise to tell the parallel stories. Mm -hmm. I would set Star Trek ahead another 500 years. Mm -hmm. I would start thinking about new technologies, but also what happens on the other side of the arc once you have all the power and you have the principles, what happens when you have too much of a good thing? Mm -hmm. How does that start to break down and, and what else is out there? Like what happens to the Borg? Mm -hmm. you know, 100 years, 500 years out. So I, I would love to see a Trek that you know expands into further, further into time, but that also continues to ex investigate the distillation of time and how we see ourselves in you know multiple universes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This, this was a, awesome. this is a very real pleasure. Stacey Abrams, Fair Fight 2020. Fairfight2020.org. If we want to go where no one has gone before and have free and fair elections in America, Fairfight2020.org. Sir, I know this may finish me as an acting ensign, but shut up, Wesley. Lieutenant, pick a good security team and let me know what he does. Aye, sir. Shut up, Wesley.